For the third year and counting, Richard Skipper has been celebrating the artists you love. And what are some of the things that you've really run out of time? And, I, and we've got to talk about your latest. I want to go back a little bit, first of all, and celebrate a true legend. Richard Skipper is all about celebrating life, art, and his guest body of work. And did you pursue performing opportunities while you were in high school? Please join us while he showcases these diverse and talented individuals. Here's Richard Skipper. Happy Saturday, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. Who or what are you celebrating tonight? There's so much to celebrate if we take the time to do so. And we all need to take a collective breath and find something to celebrate in this crazy world that we are living in. Well, today is National Fashion Day. I hope I'm a little fashionable tonight. And I am also very excited because tonight, finally, I get to sit down with Marian Alda. This is an interview. We set this interview. Are you aware that we set this interview up almost five months ago? Was it that long ago? Yes. Oh my gosh. And, and so it, it, and then and we had to cancel it. <laughs> and it's almost like every time we want to sit down to get together, something crazy happens in the world. And we keep putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. Um, if you don't, I mean, I will mention, we were scheduled to do this the day that the Uvalde shooting happened. Yes. And you and I collectively felt that it was not the time to come on and talk about celebrating. And yeah. uh, so we put that on. And then you've got this incredible podcast, which we're going to talk about, that I love. I, I love your title. I love everything about it. And I go and I listen. They're not long enough. I will say this. They're like sound bites. Yeah. They, they but that, that's, I purposely did that because, because you know, people have are so busy today. And, and I just want to give them, a, you know, always leave them wanting more, you know, and they have a quick hit it, that, you know, it'll give them something to think about during the day or it's so short that it can be pithy. You know, it can be meaningful. That's pithy people, not pissy, pithy. <laughs> Look it up if you don't know the word. If, you know, and meaningful. And it will give them a little inspiration or levity for the rest of the day. But are these, uh, do you have a certain schedule that you do them? Or is it just when something pops into your head that you feel, I need to get this off my chest? It happens. I, I do two a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays is when I post. And I realize that things happen. So I, I have a schedule of things that I want to talk about. But when something comes in that, that interferes with that, that's topical, I address it. It's like last week I addressed what happened in Highland Park um, because it, it affected me deeply because it's, you know, close to my hometown, close to where I live. And I, when, and my best, one of my best friends was from Highland Park and it yes. was, I was just, I just wanted to address it, but in a way that, you know, I think my gift, because I think we all have gifts and talents. My, my belief is that talent is what God gives to you and what you do with it is your gift to God. And I Absolutely. believe that my gift is I have a way of taking serious subjects. You know, a little bit of sugar helps the medicine go down. Yes. So I, I deliver it with humor and without any, nyeh, 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 you know, no chastisement. And I think that way people, people are more open and receptive to receiving the message because they're not being preached at. Well, I chose the word achievement today. Because you, there are so many achievements in your life uh, that we, we could spend a week uh, going over them and we still would not cover all of them. Uh, but they can go and look at your bio and do all those things at another time. I want to celebrate your body of worth and what I feel that your, your whole uh, arc of who and what you're all about, because there's so many levels to you. And I want to start with the word achievement. And sometimes in some people's lives, their achievements define who they are. And then other people, they define who their achievements become. 
if that makes mm -hmm. sense to you. It does. It and does. from your perspective, looking at the achievements of your, the arc of your career and looking, standing where you are standing right now, looking back, these achievements that you've had in your career, and you have to be proud of them, obviously, but looking at them now from this perspective, and I love the say your age point of where you are right now. Yes. Yes. Uh, and I love that about you. So let's start there. Okay. Okay. Uh, I started a Say Your Age campaign or initiative, whatever you want to call it, on Instagram. I have been, I would say, a pro-age or positive age activist, positive pro-age evangelist, um, age anarchist. There are many words for what it is that I do, but I, I really got on that path uh, in my mid fifties because I had a great, those achievements you, that you talk about, most of them were the early part of my career, the, the ones that I am known for. And then when I hit 50, suddenly the casting director stopped calling and I just like, you know, my career went off a cliff and I thought, well, that's weird. And I had a conversation with my agent and my, my agent at the time. And he said, well, you know, Marianne, you're a pretty girl. What do we do with the pretty girl when she gets old? I, I thought that was the weirdest thing. And he, he suggested at the time that I gained 50 pounds so that I could do more character work. And I thought, mm. I don't have the, the frame to carry 50 additional pounds. You know, we're built differently. I've got small bones. That would not be good for my body. Plus, I already have high blood pressure. I take medication for it. It's, you know, in my family's uh, <laughs> genetic history. And I thought, so now you're suggesting that I get possibly diabetes or and high cholesterol? I don't think so. I'm not going to put my life in jeopardy to sort of expand my career. And also, um, the parts that I was offered, as an actor, I'm a storyteller. It really is about telling a story. And the stories that I want to tell, and whatever character I do, whether it's comedy or it's uh, drama, I, I, I tend to bounce around here, but it, it, it'll all go, in, it'll all lead into one, one thing here. Uh, Simon Sinek says, Figure out your why, decide mm -hmm. on your why, and then the how will take care of itself. I have a very strong why about why I'm an actress. It's not about being in showbiz. It's, um, it really is about enlightening, entertaining. Um, you know, I, I really, whether I can see them or not, I feel a connection with my audience you know, and I don't want to disappoint them. And so when the kind of the roles that were offered me were marginal roles, I was like, I didn't become an actor because judge number nine on some procedural. I want to be a storyteller. I want to tell the story. So I, I think actors have a natural curiosity about human behavior. I became a hypnotherapist. I spent a year in training to learn how to use it therapeutically. And during my residency at the Hypnosis Motivation Institute in Tarzana, California, uh, most of the clients that I had were women around my age, the late 40s, early 50s. And there was an epidemic of depression for women in this age group. And these women had money and achievements and, and had had wonderful careers. And the common denominator among all of them, I realized mm -hmm. that they were depressed because they had internalized what society was projecting onto them, which is that women lose value and social and sexual currency as we get older. And we're living a lot longer. So they're looking at half their lives being, uh, what, invisible? Mm -hmm. You know, and and... The funny thing about actors is that we are highly suggestible. So when I was giving my clients the positive suggestions, my subconscious mind was taking it all in. And then to the point that 
I could no longer tell them to, to go out and, you know, onward and do things for themselves when I wasn't doing what I really love to do, which oh. is to act. So, uh, and, and I have to live my truth. That's just who I am. So I couldn't tell somebody to do something that I was unwilling to do. So I thought, well, I'm going to start writing for myself. If they're not going to hire me, what are the stories that I want to tell? And my very first solo show I did at the Hypnosis Motivation Institute Auditorium, and it was called Snap Out of It. You've only been hypnotized into believing you're over the hill. Mm. And, um, and I kind of, at this point in my life, I really look at my acting career as my ministry. This is the way I minister to an audience. And especially women, older women, to allow them to see themselves reflected in a way that they're not necessarily seeing themselves reflected in film and television. You know, so I went back to the theater and... And what kept me going, you know, because theater doesn't pay nearly as well as television, but what kept me going or, and what keeps me going to this day is that there's a need for what it is that I do. I mean, my, the women who come to see, to see my shows, you know, I go out after the show, I do a meet and greet with them, you know, like, like the minister does at the end of a church, mm -hmm. you know, and they tell me how meaningful it is for them. What I do isn't about me. I'm just a channel. You know, my gifts, whatever it is that I do, I am, I am using every, all the talents that God gave me. And when I leave this planet, I want to be all used up. There are, that is one large onion. Because there, <laughs> you know, there, are, no, there are so many things that I want to peel back. Okay. Uh, I am listening to everything that you're saying. And I'm going, there are so many things that I want to touch upon. Okay. Um, number one, uh, we as actors, uh, we go into this profession uh, because of the gifts that God has given us and that we want to give to the world. And I love the fact that you say that you think of your work as a, a ministry that you want to give. And we all, in terms of all of the work that we do, in terms of what we put out to the world, and we choose the work that we put into the world as well. But let's start with the casting directors and the way that they sit behind a table and you walk into a room and they, first of all, make a judgment call on who and what you're about from the moment that you walk into the room. And then they decide whether or not you're going to fit into their mold of what that character is. And I have a friend who is, uh, who is uh, you may know him, David Zimmerman. Do you know David? David Zimmerman. If you don't know him, okay. I want to put you in touch with him because he works with autistic actors and actors uh, of disabilities. Some don't have disabilities and actors of uh, all different walks of life. And I did a master class with uh, his students and it is one of the most life affirming experiences that I've ever experienced. And one of his actresses, uh, said uh, she's a little person and when she walks into a, an audition they see her for the wizard of oz they see her uh for uh uh willy wonka and the chocolate factory they see her for the christmas show at radio city musical they don't see her as a mother they don't see her as a wife they don't see her as a lover they don't see her as all of the things that she is outside her profession and it's amazing. And the other night I was watching uh, this incredible documentary that I recommend to everyone about black comedy that was on A&E. Did you see this? Uh, which one are you talking about specifically? Because there's a bunch it's, of them I've seen. There's a brand new one. It's uh, um, uh, Chris um, Hart is the executive producer. But okay. Garrett Morris, when he was on Saturday Night Live, they were doing a sketch of doctors. And when he went into the writers, they were going outside their cast to get another actor to play this because the writers could not see him in that role. Mm -hmm. And this was in the uh, late 70s. Mm -hmm. And here he was part of that ensemble of actors. And he's going, hey man, I'm here. Let me play this role. 
And he had to fight for some of the roles that he was doing on Saturday Night Live. And here is a, a Rhodes Scholar, uh, an actor who had uh, three Broadway credits under his belt, uh, who had done all these incredible roles and a published playwright. And he's fighting still within a company of actors that he already has the job. And yeah. we, you know, yeah. and uh, it, it's women, men, all of us in this profession, and it's a handful of people who are making those judgment calls as to who and what we're all about in this world. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm going to say this though about the casting directors, because the cast casting directors are doing the job that the producers are telling them to do. So, and I say that because I realized that during the pandemic. I had quite a few self-tape auditions. I booked nothing, <laughs> nothing. I had a substantial amount of auditions. I didn't book anything. And I thought, I, I worked with a coach. I took classes. I thought, what am I, do what am I doing wrong? Then the realization hit me because I realized, well, the same casting directors were still calling me in over and over and over again. If I sucked, they would stop calling me. So it obviously there was an appreciation for my work and they would bring me in because they knew that I wouldn't suck. So I wouldn't make them look bad in front of the producers, but maybe she could show them the producers. Well, here's another way you might want to go. And I realized that it wasn't my work that they didn't want. They didn't want me because they didn't want the essence that I bring to an older person that doesn't fit the stereotype of what it is that they're looking for. Mm. You know, I mean, because people say to me all the time, I'm 74 people, by the way, um, people say to me, oh, but you don't look your age. And I go, yes, I do. I do. I mean, I look good, <laughs> yeah, but, I look, but I look, uh, but I do look 74. It's just that, we're not used to seeing this version of 74 in film and television. You know, we see it on our daily lives. I mean, I know women, women who come to my shows, women who are now part of my Say Your Age campaign, mm -hmm. which, you know, let me, let me plug it. Um, I, I realized that, well, first of all, my handle on Instagram is Marianne Alda underscore aging shamelessly. That is my, that's sort of my mantra, aging shamelessly. We have to um, take the shame out of that, that women feel about getting older. You know, it's like we ask a woman, a woman, how old, well, how old are you? Oh, I'm a woman of a certain age or, oh, I never tell. Why? Because when we do tell our age, I've had conversations with people and maybe it's because of a reference that I made to something uh, historical it, that they would say, well, how old are you? And I would say my age. And then it was like the very person that I am changed right in front of their eyes. I became a different person. The, the judgment of what an older person is, despite the fact that who I am is right in front of their faces. Suddenly, all of this this uh, stuff that we've been programmed to believe about aging and getting older kicks in. And the fact is that we haven't, our brains haven't caught up with how we have evolved as in humanity because we're not aging like our parents did. First of all, most of our parents didn't get to live to be this old. That's you right. Know? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so, so what are we supposed to do with this? And it's not like you get to 60 and then you start getting old. You're getting old from the day you're born. We're aging from the day we're born. And it's on, uh, it's on a, a continuum, you know, birth through death. And everything that happens in between is, is, you know, we're getting older. We're getting older. And it's just like, ain't none of us getting out of this here alive, folks. I hate to tell you, but, you know, we're all, <laughs> it's going to get everybody. That's a and, bombshell tonight that we've all learned about. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, 
but and I think maybe is it the fear of is it mortality? Is it because like we don't want to look at those we don't want to look at those old people because we don't want to think about that. Well, guess what? You better think about that because the way I, I teach, say each generation, you know, the, the younger generations, it's like you know I'm fighting for you. I'm doing this for you. I may not be reap all the benefits of the fight against ageism that I'm doing, but hopefully you will, because guess what? At some point in time, you're going to be exactly where I am. Mm -hmm. And when younger people discriminate against older people, they're really discriminating against their future selves. Now, how stupid is that? <laughs> well, do you feel that it's the one taboo that in our country that people are still getting away with? Oh, yes, uh, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you cannot, uh, I mean, sexism, racism, ableism, the isms, they still exist, but we know that they're politically incorrect. You wouldn't, you, you know, you're not going to make a racist joke or a sexist joke and, and, and think you can get away with it. You know, somebody's going to call you on, somebody's going to call you on it. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, it's a funny, it's okay to make fun of old people. Well, that's ridiculous. That's, you know, why? Why is that funny? It's not funny. Um, it's just not funny <laughs> at all. Uh, and and I do stand-up comedy. I do not do self-deprecatory humor about getting old. I, mm -hmm. you know, I don't, you know, I'm not going to make any, I'm not going to be making any depends jokes, folks. Uh, I don't know what's so funny about that. Um, and the fact is that, you know, Bladder control has to do with not ageism, but ableism. And sometimes kidney malfunctions and stuff like that. It's like, when you look, why is, why is that funny? You know, it's like, oh, people and eh. I, I just don't. It's, it's, it's not funny. It's not kind. It's not polite. And we need to stop it. But Marianne, what I also admire so much about you is that you grabbed this and you said, I am taking control of this. I am going to own it and I am not going to put this in the corner. And, uh, you know, it's like the line from uh, Dirty Dancing. You're not putting baby in a corner. <laughs> I am going to own this and I'm going to put it out there with a bright spotlight on it and we're going to address it head on and you've made a one woman show about it you uh have an instagram page about it uh it's your twitter it it, it, it uh is all encompassing you do ted talks about it. it it you know and god bless you for putting it out there front and center because very few people are doing this you know an interview that i tried to get several years ago the actress turned me down because she was afraid of her age getting out and her age is on Wikipedia. It's on other websites. And I and and I said, well, I never mentioned a person's age, but you know, I, I it's you know, I applaud you for you know uh, saying it because it is not a stigma that we should be thinking about. Right. I mean, it's it it's I. I guess do I have age pride? I don't know. I have age acceptance. You know, I have age um, uh, awareness and recognition and consciousness of the fact that I'm getting older. There's certain adjustments that I have to make, you know, to my diet um, and make sure that I exercise. It, you know, I always say vanity is my friend. Mm -hmm. Just because I'm older, it's like, I'm, not, I'm still vain, okay? <laughs> I was like, that's the last thing to go. But I'm not trying to look younger. I'm just trying to look good, you know? Um, and so when people say, again, when people say, oh, but you don't look your age. Yes, I do. Well, and I'm doing some people give up. And someone said, well, how should I dress for this event? I said, dress the way you want to be photographed. Mm -hmm. And she said, I like that. I said, you never know when that camera is going to hit you. I mean, I, I if I'm going to go to the supermarket, if I'm going to go, you never know. And you're going to run into somebody. Uh, when you think you're going in just for a head of lettuce, you are absolutely <laughs> going to run into somebody that you're not expecting to run into. Absolutely. And you know it. So, I mean, with um, when did the TED Talks begin for you? And, uh, and you've become very successful in that realm of the business as well. And 
it must be affirming for you to stand in front of men, women, everyone, you know, affirming for them because they need to hear the message as well. Yeah, and, and people walk out feeling a little bit better. You know, um, Becca Levy has a book out now, the, the age, the age, breaking the age code. Mm -hmm. And I used her as one of my resources in my TED talk. She, because she's been working in this arena for a good several decades now. And back in the early 2000s, she did a study at Yale. And people who have a positive attitude about getting older live on average seven and a half years longer than people who have a negative attitude. Think about that. Not only that, but when we feel good about ourselves, when we're happy about ourselves, we take better care of ourselves. So we probably spend more on health care uh, that is required. Whereas we spend it, if we spend it on preventative care, you know, it would probably be a lot cheaper, you know, health. Just because you're old doesn't mean you're going to get sick. Old and healthy saves a lot of, it's real good for the economy. Um, and okay. So my first talk on ageism, I, AARP started a, um, a program about uh, age disruptors about maybe about three or mm -hmm. four years ago. And it was a new program and I had gotten home from someplace. I, I think I had done a stand-up gig. Anyway, it was early in the morning. I'm going through my emails and I see this thing from AARP. And it was a newsletter, age disruptor newsletter. And there were all these people saying about uh, why they were disrupting aging, if they were an artist or they had they were an entrepreneur and started a new business after 60. And I looked at it. And I thought, where's the diversity? You know, and, and, and so I, they said at the bottom of the newsletter, it said, tell us your story. I, sorry, I guess I, this is always, this is my email. I've been a woman and black all my life, but not even that prepared me for the discrimination I would face once I got to be old. Wow. I, I sent it off. Like a week or so later, my phone is blowing up. They wanted to talk to me about it. And they sent a camera crew to come and interview me and film me on it and about it. And I talk about, uh, you know, women losing value as we get older. Um, and so it's a really quick little short piece. But the response to that is, you're, you're, you're right, Richard. I'm saying some of the things out loud that people are thinking that they don't want to talk about. Mm -hmm. That it's that it's a taboo, and um, but in the years since then, I've I've changed my mind. I'm I'm reevaluating that. I think the fact that I am a woman and that I'm black prepared me to face ageism because mm -hmm. I have because I have already I had to stand up to those discriminations. I had to face those so that by the time I had to face ageism, well, that was just another ism, you know, but by that time my muscles were, you know, I had built up my, my pecs. I was strong so that um, it's like, I'm not going to take this lying down. Oh no. You know, so I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bit of a badass, I guess, in that way. Richard, you might say. <laughs> that's, part of my that's part of my personality. Well, don't, good don't tell you. me no. no but I, I'm, I'm loving hearing, I mean, you, you know, the fact that you, that you, this turned you around in terms of the way that you are approaching this. You know, and having gone through these levels, it's like levels, almost like levels of grief that you yes. went through those levels of grief and you went through it and you went, okay, I've gone through it. Now it's time for me. I pushed that aside. And I, like tomorrow, uh, you know, I was at Costco today uh, buying all this stuff because tomorrow I'm planning a memorial for one of my best friends uh, who passed away in December. Uh, she was born blind. 
uh, she was, uh, I mean, she, she did a show called uh, Black, Blind, and Beautiful. Oh. And she did a song called Black, Blind, and Beautiful. Look her up, everybody, Peggy Eason. Uh, at 60, she jumped out of a, an airplane skydiving. Um, there's a, a clip of her, uh, Marianne, look her up. Uh, I am. Doing Defying Gravity, uh, jumping out of an airplane, Peggy Eason. And she taught me how to see the world uh, as a blind woman, uh, because the last thing that you ever wanted to refer to her uh, was uh, was a victim or an invalid or anything. She was strong, she was determined. But my point was that I was at Costco today and uh, after tomorrow would have been her birthday. And after the service tomorrow, we're having a big barbecue celebration. And the guy that, we were, that was checking me out said, um, it's almost like what they do in New Orleans where they really do a celebration. Mm -hmm. And I said, she deserves a party and we're gonna have a big party for her tomorrow. And uh, we've gone through the grief grieving stage and now it's time to celebrate who and what she's about. I, you know, I'm going to be 62 on my next birthday. And uh, as I get older, and I even said this to someone uh, earlier today, and I was discussing the fact that we were going to have this talk tonight. And I said, the aging process doesn't scare me. What scares me is when I, when I see older people that are alone and they don't have the support that they need and they've, you know, Circumstances have gotten them there. That is very scary that those people are alone in the world with no family or friends or people. Um, uh, I've been very involved with the Actors Fund and I've gone to see friends in the Actors Home and people who had amazing careers are lying alone in these rooms with no one there to see them. And that is that part of the process that scares me. But getting older doesn't bother me at all. Well, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to allay some of your fears, Richard. Uh, you're not gonna end up alone later because of the way you're living your life now. You're building your community. You're, you're paying it forward by having a celebration for your friend. Your friends seeing that now, that is how you will be celebrated when it's time for you, you to move on. We, this is why I talk about being, we have to age consciously. You know, part of the denial of getting older and then just saying, ooh, it's bad. Um, when we do that, we don't take the steps that we need to take so that we can have a fulfilling later life. You know, because we need to, I, I started planning, um, I started planning an, a good old life long time ago, long before I ever got here, because I always had a respect for being older. I mean, as an actor, I thought, I'm never going to retire. Somebody's always going to have to play the older characters. And why mm -hmm. not me? And, uh, and I have friends from all generations, you know, all ethnicities, it's, it's like, I don't have just people of my generation. And the thing about it is, you know, they say, if you want to make a friend, be a friend. Absolutely. You have to, if, if you have to be a giver without any expectation of, of, you know, getting anything back and you will be taken care of, mm -hmm. you know, that's, there's, that's the quantum physics, you know, if you want to call it God, whatever it is you want to call it, but but just living your life joyfully and, and feeling that we are part of something that is bigger than just us and knowing that, that contributing to the better, betterment of it is our price for admission because we didn't have to be here. And the fact that we are is a miracle. We're all miracles and we should, we should act accordingly. Well, as an actress and with these tools that you now have underneath your belt um has it changed the way that you approach a role uh when you are given a script in uh in the way that you go about uh approaching the character now i have studied with so many people 
I studied with, with Michael Howard in New York, with Ed Covens at the Strasbourg. I mean, I studied with a lot of different people and took a little bit from here, a little bit from there. Um, so that I think, first of all, everybody's instrument is different. So everybody has to play it differently according to how their instrument works. Mm -hmm. Having had had all these this different experience, oh, sidebar, okay. And this is what really pissed me off too. It's like after 30 years of you know being in the business, I thought, I really know how to, I'm good at this now. And then you're gonna cut me off? That's terrible. You know, I thought, oh, no, 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 no. I, I, I know this stuff now. I know my craft. I'm good at it. Um, what, I, what I do, and this is my own personal way of working. Um, sometimes characters come very easily to me uh, because I identify strongly with them. Those I don't have to work on quite as much but I have to corral them, that character, so that I don't put too much, I know exactly how much of me to infuse into that character. Other times I have to really work on a character and do, you know, the, give it the backstory. You know, where did she come from? Who were her parents? Um, I studied with Stella Adler in New York, script interpretation. Wow. And so I look at what do the other characters say about me when I'm not around? You know, so how, why, where did they get those opinions? Um, what kind of food does she eat? What kind of, what, why does, what kind does she language things? Why did, would she use the word crimson as opposed to red? What does that say about her status, her education? I do all that work. I do all that work. I do all the intellectual work. Then I sit and I meditate because I have now created this character energetically. And so I sit and I ask the character, is there anything that I've missed? Is there anything that you want the audience to know about you that, that I've missed? Let me know. And then I allow myself to receive that information. Wow. That Marianne, sounds a little woo woo, doesn't it? But that's how I work. I want to take your master class. <laughs> <laughs> Have you, I mean, have you done master classes yourself teaching? I taught uh, at the Negro Ensemble Company for two years in New York. I had actually trained with NEC two years, 40 years ago. Uh, Lawrence Fishburne, Robert Townsend, oh, yeah. um, uh, uh, Marjorie Johnson, Dan Martin. They were, they were all, we were all in class together. And many, 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 many years later, I was, uh, I was in New York. And I taught. I tell all of my all of my actors, and a lot of them were very young actors, all, all under the age of thirty five, and just starting out in their careers. And I would say to anyone who is in the arts right now, any actor who is listening to me at this moment, we are in a service industry. We are in service to our audience. Mm -hmm to the director, to the playwright who's written this. And we're in service to the producer who's paying for everything. We are in service. It's not about us. Oh, me, my, me. Thank no, no, you. No, no, no. Thank you. I always <laughs> say, I, I can't believe you just, I always say when it, it, with every job that I've gotten, I always walk in and I say, I checked my ego at the door. This is because uh, for me, I love the collaboration and even doing a one man show, you do TED Talks, you're on that stage, but you're never alone. There's someone in the lighting booth. There's someone collecting tickets at the door. There's the audience there. Uh, it's the entire uh, staff of people in that theater, that space that you've come into uh, to make this evening possible. Uh, it's the whole collaboration. And thank you for saying that because it's all about that. Absolutely. And sometimes when I first started doing stand-up and I started doing stand-up um, when I became the primary caretaker for my mom, I would watch her during the day. <clears throat> my sister would come home from work and I would go into the city and I took a class with Linda Smith at Caroline's in New York. Um, no. The very first time I was on stage, I was terrified 
because as an actor, you know, you're used to playing a character. And, you know, now it's like, I'm, I'm playing myself, I'm being judged. What got me to calm down was that I thought, I'm just going to make my audience my scene partner. You know, oops, where did you go, Richard? Oh, there you are. Uh, I disappeared. You did. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened there. And then the in the uh, uh, and the resolution changed. Uh, I don't know what happened here. I'm on a I am on a temporary computer, and all kinds <laughs> of things are going. I'm going to fix this. Keep talking. Okay. So I, I I made my audience my scene partner. So I would instead of being afraid of them. I broke down that fourth wall and I would engage with them instead of performing as a, uh, as doing the character of stand up comedian. I now embody, I know I do, I am a stand up and I make my audience my scene partner. I talk to them, you know, it's like, and I, and it, and it's like, and I get, because sometimes they'll be like, what? or sometimes I'll laugh or come, kind of, you know, so mm -hmm. I engage with them. So that's, you know, what I, what I made them my, yeah, I made them my scene partner. Mm -hmm. And, um, okay, what was the original question, Richard? Because I know I kind of got went off here. <laughs> where, you, you, where was this going? You, you know, this, you went off the screen. And, and then everything went crazy. <laughs> <laughs> no, we were talking Ooh. about uh, collaboration and, and all oh, the yeah. people that are around you. You mentioned that you, you know, you were be, uh, the primary uh, caretaker for your mom, and then you would take care of her during the day, and then you would go out and take okay. care of her uh, during the evening. So, and that's where we were. Okay, but there was a point before that that this was leading to, and I forgot what the point was. So well, we were talking about collaboration. We'll, 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 we'll get our way back. Yes. We'll work our way back to it. Yes. Uh, 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 let's see. We're talking about uh, the Negro Ensemble Company. We're talking about actors and that we are in a service industry. Uh, yes. It's, we were in that ballpark. And there was a, another point that I wanted to make. I can't remember what it was, but it'll it'll come back to me. Ah, ooh, you're back. Crazy things are happening here. I don't know. That's okay. uh, but anyway, I want to get I want to get back to uh, our word of the day being achievement. And with all the achievements that you've occurred, I want to look back for a moment. Okay. And in this business, all of us, there's a moment that happens where you go, I've arrived. This is where I belong. Was there a particular moment where that happened for you? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it was the character of Dee Dee Bannister on Edge of Night. That's, you know, that's when I had... <laughs> Security, I had been doing a lot of television commercials, making a good living. <laughs> but, you know, when you get a big residual check, you better save it because you never know what's going to, when you're going to need it. You, but that was the first time that I was getting a steady paycheck. It was a real job. That's when my parents stopped asking me, what are you going to get a real job? <laughs> uh, because I had one. And also they sort of became local celebrities because they would say, oh, yeah, I saw your daughter on television. And they, they you know, they love that. Um, but until that time, they were kind of worried about me. It was, yes, it was that character and why it was so meaningful to me is because, now, keep in mind, this is 1981. And you mentioned what Garrett Morris went through in the mm -hmm. 70s. In the 70s, um, the conventional wisdom with the SAG and AFTRA was that Black actors couldn't do television because we were trained in the theater. So there were very few Black actors in daytime television. Um, what made me a believer was when I was in college and I was watching All My Children and I saw Frank and Nancy Grant, Lisa Wilkerson and John Donnell, and uh, Ellen Holly and Al Freeman Jr. on One Life to Live. I mean, I thought, ooh, I wanna do that. I, I, I wanna tell those kinds of stories because Agnes Nixon was a great storyteller and those are yes. really rich stories. So when I came on Edge of Night, the character was only supposed to be uh, in a three month story arc to create a love triangle. 
And after three months, um, Nick Nicholson, who was the producer, came up to me and he said, um, yeah, are you liking it, kid? And I said, I like it just fine. He said, yeah, well, we like you too. Have your agent call me. <laughs> and, wow. and then and I went to, um, no, you know, here's a funny story though. So we had that conversation. My agent called him. He didn't get back to my agent. There was a period of several weeks when nothing really happened. During that period, I booked a douche commercial for Summer's Eve. <laughs> it was a Procter & Gamble product, mm -hmm. and Edge of Night was a Procter & Gamble show. So I, I had to ask for the time, the, rearranging my schedule so I could shoot the commercial. Nick calls me into his office, and he said, you know, we can't have our little Dee Dee doing a douche commercial. He was asking me not to do that commercial. And I said to him, well, you know, Nick, I don't have a contract here. Commercials is how I make my living. And he said, I'll talk to your agent in the morning. That was it. I, I turned down that commercial and I got the contract. Wow. You know, that, isn't it wonderful when a moment like that happens in your career? Yeah, it's just I, but, incredible. And and I, but I, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say that the but when those moments happen, we have to. Oh, I do remember now what I was going to say. I, I can get back to it. Okay, about it has about it's an acting thing. We have to respect our craft. We have to respect our talent. You don't have to be shitty about it, but you have to be, you have to, uh, you have to honor the gift that is in you before anyone will respect it. It's earned. You don't have to go like, eh, 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 but you have to, you know, sometimes people fight to be respected because they don't respect themselves. But mm. when you respect yourselves, there's no, uh, there's no anger or rage in it. It's just like you command respect. You command it. You don't demand it. Wow. You know, there's a difference. Okay, now about the acting thing. Uh, a lot of times, I worked worked in a professional situation with actors who, you know, you've done the work and you've created your character, especially when you're doing a, on a regular, on a show, you know that character pretty well. Oh, you get the script. My character would never say that. My character would never do that. I get that script. Might be something that's totally out of character for my character. But the first thing I do is what was going on with her that this day that she would say something like that? What was going on? You know, you, there's a richness and layers that can be developed when you look at it that way and you ask those questions. What was going on with her that day that she would say something like that? As opposed to saying, my character would never do that. You don't know that character wouldn't do that. Maybe she would. Why? What was going on? Mm -hmm. And you get, and that's where you get the richness and depth of character. Wow. We're having a master class right now, Richard. <laughs> We're definitely having a master class. No, that's absolutely true because, I mean, we all have moments where we talk about things that are going on in this world. I, forgive me for where I'm going to go with this for just a moment. Okay. So I hope you'll go with me. I'm, I'm with you, Richard. I'm, I'm okay. along for the ride. So we talk about the state of the world, when you and I were scheduled, uh, I don't say the word supposed to, because if it was supposed to happen, it would have happened. We were scheduled to sit down and talk the day of the Uvalde shooting. As we, I'm prepping for this week and promoting this week, we have yet another shooting. And then we've got some politicians who say, the only thing that will stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. And my comment on that 
is the only thing that's uh, that changes a bad man with a, I mean, a good guy with a gun from becoming a, a bad guy with a gun is a trigger because in a snap decision, a person can change. Now, none of us, hopefully, are that extreme, but there are cases all the time. The problem with where we are in the world right now is that people are using guns as a point of resolution. And many times people are doing things and the day before they could not even have fathomed that they would have gone that far. You never know when you're going to be pushed to that level of crossing that line. And I'm not talking about mass killers. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about these snap decisions that people make in our lives. So as extreme as that is with where I just went with that, it goes along the lines of what you're saying with finding that spot in all of us where as actors, we would say, my, my, my character would never say that. My character would never do that. And yet you find that little window or that little spot where you go, perhaps there's a moment where that person would say that or my character would go there and finding that glimmer or that glimpse into their psyche that would get them there. Right. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just along the lines of what you're saying about the current state of the world and uh, people getting triggered to do things. I have this saying that vegetables take on the flavor of the broth that they're cooked in. We are in a toxic soup right now. Mm -hmm. The world is toxic. So that if you are, and, and you know, some guns, what do they call her? Quick trigger. You know, it's like you just tap them and they go, they, you know, and then some, you really have to pull the handle on it. Like I know about guns, but I, I think, you know, there's some that are, and the human psyche is like that. You know, there are times when uh, if the environment and the support uh, is there, people who might do horrible things don't do them. Sanity is often situational. So that, and it doesn't happen overnight. What happened, for example, with this young man in Highland Park, what was going on in him had been building up for an awfully long time. And a lot of the, and, and there were no guardrails. There, there were no guardrails. And that's what happened. And I'll cool. bet if you talk to him today, he would say, oh, shit. Because now he's, he's going to be in jail for that. He's 21 years old. He's going to be incarcerated for the rest of his life. Yes, exactly. But it was so, but he, methodically planned this out the way that you study a script. He planned this out. Um, the guy who went into the supermarket in Buffalo, he planned this out with a precision. So when they want to attribute this to mental illness, I go, no, these are very smart people. Absolutely. I mean, I would not have the knowledge to do what they're doing, nor do I want that kind of knowledge, but they are very methodical in terms of how they plan these things out. And it's, it, you know, it's a, it's a horrible, I mean, and it's just on how we choose to expand our energy on this planet. And I am so grateful for the way that you are spending your energy on this planet, well, you know, on, you know, on, all the levels that you've done. Um, you know, as we're going to be winding down in a few moments, normally I do these wind down questions, but we'll go way over if we do that. But I always okay. do a um, a surprise question. Uh, it's a question that I haven't even looked at uh, from this box of questions. So I'm going to pull this surprise okay. question. I don't even know what it is, but here it is. Who are three people that you want on your team? <laughs> This is going to be a bizarre question. <laughs> Uh-oh. Okay. 
Okay. Who are three people that you want on your team if there was a zombie a cop, a, a apocalypse? <laughs> cannot begin to it okay my son my son christopher he's just like he 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 i i am a uterine cancer survivor i had my had my had my surgery he came into town he you know he stayed with me for the length of time he was in my room the whole time when i came home he said i think you need me to be here a little longer i this is kind of gross, but we're talking about the zombie apocalypse, so I guess I can go there. You can. I, 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 you know, you have this bowel problem. I thought I was just having a fart, and it was, I crapped on myself, basically. I'm in bed, and then I went, oh, 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 and I'm like, I just, I just, my son, who was sitting in the chair, came over to me, picked me up. Brought me into the bathroom. He had a little chair in the bathroom. Sat me down. He said, "Are you okay?" He said, "Yes." I said, "Yes." I took a shower. He brought me a change of clothes. When I came out, he had stripped the bed, put it in the washing machine, and changed the bed. And then he put me back in bed. God bless him. He got so so. That's, that's I, I got to have my kid there for this. That's love. Um, and uh, let's see. A second, okay. I don't, I'm not going to get a, a person, but I will be, I'll say a stage manager. I want a good stage manager because they can fix anything. <laughs> I, I traveled across, you know, they can, re, you know, they can make a good stage manager, a stage manager. Okay, my son and a stage manager. And the third one, I'm just going to say Jesus. There you go. Good, 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 good. <laughs> And somehow, I, if if it happens in my area, I want to bring you along, and I want to, and I do want to do a shout out to Lisa Rodrigo who, who made this happen tonight. So, hey, and, Lisa. And I've got one other uh, uh, question, and it's again another surprise question that I haven't seen. Okay. Um, and it says, um, and I like this one, uh, and I'm going to ask uh, for, uh, let, I'm going to pull up the number four. Okay. I want you to share a four positive moments that you will never forget. Hmm. Okay, the first one that comes to mind is the night I saw Obama become president because I never thought I would see that in my lifetime. I wish my parents had been here to see it, but they were not. Um, uh, I've just talked about my son. I'm going to have to say when my son was born. Um, except, no, I'm not going to say when he was born. I was going to say when I, because uh, his dad and I divorced, he was bouncing back and forth between New York and, and, and L.A. And I will never forget, <laughs> he had, he was in bed on top of the bed. He was reading a book and he had his headphones on. And I came and I said, Chris, he was 19 at the time, I think. Maybe, I think maybe he's still in high school. Maybe he's around 17. And I said, do you think I'm a good mom? He was so cool. He took his earphones on and he goes, mom, I'm not in a gang. I'm a good kid. I get good grades. He said, now, if the purpose of a parent is to make sure that the next generation gets on the right path, you tell me, are you a good mom? I went, <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> That's beautiful. You know? Okay. Um, and let's see. Um, I would think, I th would think, I'm thinking of one that hasn't happened yet, but just say I have my acceptance speech ready. Okay, great. <laughs> and, um, and okay, this is a weird one. And this is something that hasn't happened yet either. But uh, I told you that I'm a uterine cancer survivor. When I was first diagnosed, I also was, had a virus or something like that. And I thought, I was feeling really bad and I thought, okay, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm gone. I'm, I'm done. And I remember it was on a 
Friday, I, again, I called up my son and over the phone, I started planning my memorial service. I said, no, listen, I want everybody to have a good time. These are the stories I want you to tell about me, Chris, because I want everybody laughing. It's going to be a party. So um, I would say that is, is like, yes, my memorial, whenever that happens, it's going to be a party. It's going to be a blast. And throughout the ethers, I'm going to be there. Absolutely. So. Uh, uh, one more, one more. Okay. One more. Um, I would say, okay. Being here with you, Richard. Oh. <laughs> oh. Wow. 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 Well, we're going to give this away. Is fun. Oh, uh, we're going to give away uh, something. The word of the day is achievement. So I'm going to give away something having to do with achievement. Uh, let me, uh, pull this up and we'll see who our winner is. Glenn Charlo. Glenn Charlo, everyone, does all the graphics. He did the graphic for tonight's show. Uh, so Glenn Charlo does incredible work. So Glenn, you're the winner tonight. And uh, call me later, Glenn, and uh, I'll tell you what you won. Uh, so I'm going to remove this uh, and I'm going to bring this up here. I'm going to give uh, my closing remarks and then Marianne, I'm going to give you the closing remarks for tonight. I will leave the screen and you've got the screen to yourself. Uh, and don't worry about how to end the show. When you say goodbye, uh, the credits will end. Uh, so uh, we'll uh, begin, I should say. Um, I want to thank you all for being here. It's a Saturday night. You could have been anywhere else for the last hour. And I don't take it lightly uh, that you are here. So thank you for being here. Marianne, I, when are you going to write your book? Well, you know, okay. I can get a shameless plug in here. You know, I have a podcast. It's on Anchor and Spotify. And it's called Because um, I'm Old and I've Got Shit to Say. <laughs> Which I love. <laughs> and and it's my, it's, it's observational essays, but humorous about, you know, life, you know, wise from my perspective. Because I, I've, been on this planet a lot of years. I've got a lot of uh, observations and a lot of comments and a lot of, I think, solutions to some things. And I do, I post on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And as I do them, I'm keeping it in a collection. And I think by the end of the year, I'll have enough to pitch to an agent. And it's going to be a book. And the book is going to be because I'm old and I've got shit to say. When the book is done, will you come back? Oh, sh absolutely. Oh, my God. I'd love to have... I, I wish you could come once a week, at least here. And I'm sitting on some possible big news, too. So Ooh, uh, let's excited. send positive vibes that uh, absolutely. a big announcement will be made uh, within the next week or so. So anyway, my closing remarks tonight is achievement. We can, If you believe it, you can make it happen. Uh, I have a one-man show called The Magic of Believing. Uh, those of you who know me know that... Uh, when I, and next month will be 43 years ago that I came to New York. Uh, when I was uh, 13 years old, I was reading The Magic of Believing by Claudia Bristol. And do you know the book? I was just going to say that my father was a Pullman porter on the railroad. And he used to bring home comic books and magazines. And when I was nine years old, he brought home the book Psycho Cybernetics by Maxwell Maltz. So I was nine years old reading Psycho Cybernetics. So I think that's why we're vibing so well. <laughs> we had that, that common understanding, that woo woo, but also recognizing how all things work and how we attract the law of attraction. Absolutely. Yeah. And my friend Danielle is here and she says more woo, more woo, more <laughs> woo. And we put a lot of woo out in the world. So Everyone, you know, uh, thank you for being here. After tonight's show, please go to YouTube, leave a comment about what you thought about tonight's show, and share this with your friends. That helps with the ranking. Um, and uh, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, a lot of my friends are here tonight. You know that I say this at the end of every show. Um, go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Go to your Facebook friends list and reach out to the fourth name that pops up and reach out tonight with a phone call. Glenn, Charlo, you and I are going to talk later tonight. Uh, but reach out with a phone call and let that person know what they mean to you. Uh, not an email message, not a text message, not a private inbox message, but a phone call. And let that person know what they truly mean in your lives. My friend Peggy Eason, I mentioned earlier tonight, this memorial that we're having tomorrow, I spoke with her the night before she passed away. And her passing away the next day was sudden and unexpected. 
nobody was expecting it to happen. So you never know when that phone call will be the last one. So I know that she's up there watching. Tomorrow's her birthday and we celebrate her. And I celebrate all of you. And I thank you for being here tonight. Um, but as a dear friend of mine says, uh, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. You never know what someone else is going through right now. And I always say, if you're gonna go out in a boat, and Marianne, I really mean this, if you're gonna go out in a boat, make sure you bring a skipper along. So <laughs> I'm gonna leave when you've got the screen to yourself and I can't wait until you come back. Please stay in touch. Oh, absolutely. And let me just say this too. You need the skipper, the captain and Marianne. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Okay, it's all yours, Marianne. You've got the perfect <laughs> word tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, um, this is really great, uh, Richard. I really appreciate your allowing me to be on your show. And if there's one thing that I want to leave with with everyone, it's a message that my daddy said to me when I was uh, growing up. He said. Because you're a little colored girl, because we were called that then back in the 50s, you're going to have to work 10 times as hard as those other folks. But don't let anybody else's no stop your yes. I don't care how old you are or what your gender is, your ethnicity. I don't, I don't care what's going on with you. But whoever you are, you probably need to hear this. Don't let anybody else's no stop your yes. Good night. <laughs>